Well, hello there, Richard Tubb here, and welcome to another episode of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. Now, long-time listeners of this show will know that I really enjoy using this podcast as a platform to shine a light on the tools and solutions that you may not have heard about, but which can help you to grow your IT solution provider or manage service provider business. So today I'm excited because I'm speaking with the founder of a really interesting new tool, new platform for MSP cybersecurity. Benjamin Netta is a French entrepreneur, he's a veteran of the tech industry, and he's the founder of Riot, an all-in-one platform that drives better protection for MSPs. Now, Riot is a software as a service platform, a SaaS platform, and the company is on a mission to turn employees into your company's biggest cybersecurity assets. Benjamin, welcome to Top Talk. Hey, Richard. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. I think we, before we came on air, we were just talking about you give Paris of your as your hometown, but Riot is headquartered in San Francisco, I think. So where are you joining us from today? Paris today. Oh, but Paris. The company, so... the company started in San Francisco. So right. in San Francisco, but you're in Paris today. How is Paris uh, for the tech startup scene? Do you enjoy working there? It's awesome right now. It's, okay. it's much better than five years ago. It's growing very rapidly. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time with uh, managed service providers in Paris. Wonderful scene there, lovely people. And the food, ah, well, that could be uh, a yeah. podcast in itself. But <laughs> <laughs> So I guess to, to jump in, how would you describe what Riot does? Uh, so we prepare employees for cyber attacks. So that's the, I mean, we, we created a platform that initially was uh, mostly sending uh, and simulating phishing attacks on employees mm. uh, to detect weaknesses. Uh, so you would, uh, you would uh, as a, a CTO or a CISO, CISO you would um, set up the platform very easily, uh, launch an attack on your employees uh, and see who's uh, vulnerable and need more, needs, needs more training. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, and uh, so what we discover is that we were uh, solving a problem, but creating a new one. So we were solving the who is vulnerable in my team, uh, but creating the problem of now I have 20% of my team who's vulnerable. What should I do with that? Uh, and so we, that's when we um, created the second part of Riot. Uh, we created a, a bot called, um, cyber, I call it a cybersecurity companion that plugs into Slack and Microsoft Teams. Uh, called Albert. Mm. And Albert is uh, teaching cybersecurity basics to employees. Uh, so cur cur uh, covering all the needs for uh, cybersecurity awareness to grow the cybersecurity culture uh, in companies. Yeah, makes sense. I, I've so much that I want to speak to you about, about not just Albert, but right as a company. But Tell us about the team at Riot. So we've already said you're in Paris. Uh, the business is headquartered in San Francisco. Who else is involved in the business? What does it look like? Uh, it's pretty simple today. So we're 25 people, mostly based in Paris. Uh, we have some people in, in England as well. Mm. Uh, but the team is pretty simple. It's half tech, half sales today. Um, with um, the, uh, the, some people who are also in customer success. But that's mostly sales and tech. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you're, you're, you're managing a remote team, England, San Francisco, Paris. This is, you know, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs on the show here. This is the modern way of doing things, isn't it? No, I'm, I'm trying to uh, avoid the remote uh, experience. Really? But, okay. uh, you know, yeah, when, from time to time, you end up finding the right people somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it happened a few times. And uh, so now we have someone in London, we have someone in, in uh, Mallorca. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. The rest of the team is in Paris. Um, and initially I was in San Francisco, but I had to go back uh, to France because of COVID. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know as well from uh, looking into Riot, there's an interesting story behind why you created Riot as a business. Can you share a little bit more with us? Of course. Yeah. So Riot is my second company, actually. Um, prior to Riot, I uh, co-founded a fintech called uh, October. We were doing loans uh, to uh, European companies. Uh, and uh, I think we lent uh, around a billion uh, euros worth of loan uh, to this day uh, to, Euro to European companies. Um, and I was, so I founded this company in 2014, uh, ran uh, tech uh, for uh, five years, 
And uh, part of my um, role was to be sure that, uh, so that we created this platform that was handling hundreds of millions of euros of transactions every year. And part of my, my job was to making sure that we don't get act, obviously. Um, so I was spending a lot of money on, uh, you know, uh, protecting the platform because I was pretty sure that a hacker would find a clever way to hijack the money, find a, a loophole in a, uh, on an endpoint, something very sophisticated. Um, and so spending a lot of money on pen testing, uh, uh, booties and so on. And um, one day in 2019, uh, an employee uh, received a phishing email and uh, clicked enter its password. Uh, and so that's basically how we got hacked the first time. And so that, that's when I realized um, I was wrong about hackers or they're much more pragmatic than, than we think. Uh, and they don't want to spend time um, uh, hacking around, trying to find loopholes in complex systems uh, when they can just uh, send phishing emails and, uh, and uh, enter uh, your company that way. Yeah. So that's uh, actually when Riot started because I had, um, I was doing cybersecurity awareness the old way at the time. So basically gathering everyone in a room um, and speaking about cybersecurity for an hour, I was pretty sure that uh, no one was listening. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's how I decided to, uh, to over the weekend over to, uh, to uh, launch an attack on, uh, on my team. Uh, and so I launched this attack on the whole team on 110 employees at the time. Uh, and uh, the first person who clicked uh, entered, uh, and told, entering its password was the CFO. Oh. And um, wow! in the end, on my first attack, 20% of them ended up clicking, entering the password. And, you know, I, 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 I think we recruited well. Uh, and I thought we uh, recruited people with uh, good, you know, cybersecurity hygiene and, uh, and uh, knowledge and uh, culture. Uh, and I discovered I was wrong. Um, and I was telling the story around uh, to my CTO friends and they were saying, hey, I want to try it on my team. Um, and so that's when I realized that uh, Riot was more than a, a side project. Wow. That, it's, it's so amazing. Well, first of all, it's really scary, isn't it? When you see, you know... It is, it is. But you and I get phishing emails all the time and things. And I can tell you, I've not been caught yet, but it's been very close because they some of them are very, very good. And so I think for people who are not as savvy as you and I and the listeners to this show, you know, the odds of getting caught are increasing daily, aren't they? They're very sophisticated out there. But yeah, what, what was that reaction like when you realized that the CFO had uh, been caught out? Uh, I had mixed feelings because my uh, it, it was also an, an approval that my side project was uh, useful somehow. So I had this, uh, this feeling of, um, I think at the time we just raised a series B of 40 million. And basically the CFO is the person who has the, the key to the, you know, the, the keys to the account. And uh, so to me, uh, CFO should be the, the most uh, prepared employee in the team. Um, and so I had mixed feelings, yes. Yeah, uh, it's good. And I think, you know, the, the audience of this show, predominantly uh, managed service providers, IT professionals who look after clients. There's a lot of chief financial officers, a lot of accounts people out there as well that they look after. And unfortunately, it's all too common, isn't it, that the people who have got the keys to the kingdom within their client sites are the ones most likely, A, to be targeted, by the cyber criminals and B, unfortunately, because they move very fast and just click things without thinking, they're the, the ones most likely to be caught as well, in my experience anyway. That's true, that's true, I know. So yeah, you have to prepare them for cyber attacks anyway. Yeah, so, so you mentioned, thank you for sharing the story of that. It, it's an amazing story and I can understand why Riot you know, came out of that situation there. Very common as well, I would say, that um, I've interviewed lots of people on this podcast who have created a tool to fix a problem and then realised that lots of other people need that as well. So your CTO, uh, Chief uh, Technical Officer friends, who are saying, hey, can we can we have that tool themselves? So the next part of the story, I guess, you know, I read that um, Riot has emerged from Y Combinator. You've raised $3 million in their 2020 seed round. What has that journey been like for you as an entrepreneur? Uh, so 
I don't know. It's a it's a weird feeling, but basically, uh, what happened after the I I, I realized uh, Riot was actually maybe a product. I wasn't even sure it was a company, but I I knew at this point that it was a product. Um, I, I applied. So basically, for the first time ever, YC was I, I, YC is Y Combinator. Yeah. Uh, I've been telling it so much in the past three years that I um tried to shorten, but um. So basically, YC was uh, interviewing for the first time in Paris. So basically, um, uh, initially, YC was bringing everyone to San Francisco for the interviews. Uh, and for the first time, they were traveling. So the team was uh, doing interviews in San Francisco for uh, the US-based uh, companies, in, uh, in Paris for European companies, and I think in um, Mumbai for Asian companies or something like this. Um, and basically, I, you, you have this team of uh, 16 uh, people, very talented partners, uh, going to Paris and interviewing companies. Uh, I thought it's probably a good way to challenge my idea of what a uh, ride could be. And um, they were also, they were interviewing like uh, three minutes walk from my place. Ah, so I easy. thought, hey, I don't have much to lose. I mean, worst case scenario, the interview is like 10 minutes. Um, I lost 15 minutes uh, walking back and forth uh, three minutes uh, and uh, 10 minutes interviews and that's it. And I get a ton of feedback on my ID. And uh, uh, YC is very selective. I think they take 1% of all applications. And so I was pretty sure I was not part of those uh, 1%. Uh, and I ended up getting accepted. Um, and the next day uh, I had coffee with my uh, co-founders uh, telling them that, uh, you know, I, this first company I founded October was doing pretty well. Um, but I mean, Riot and uh, cybersecurity is a huge opportunity. I think it's going to be one of the top three problems in the world in the next 10 years. Um, I have to go. Uh, it's a YC is like a childhood dream to me. So um, end of, end of tw that was end of 2019. And uh, I ended up working at October on uh, last day of December and started working on Riot on January, January 3rd. Uh, so basically, I took three days between both uh, experiences. <laughs> wow, that is an amazing story from, from start to finish. So, you know, I'm really impressed with where you come from, where you're going. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying. You know, th this is the biggest challenge that's going to be facing not just the IT industry, but many of us in the world full stop uh, here, there. So if I can, let's get into the weeds a little bit with cybersecurity. I've already said, I think the majority of MSPs listening to this would have, have experienced chief financial officers, CEOs, bosses, who, you know, um, perhaps are the weakest link within their organization, unfortunately. But is it's probably fair to say that uh, the majority of MSPs listening would probably agree that the weakest link in cybersecurity full stop is human beings. <laughs> so how do you see Riot helping MSPs strengthen that weak link how can we use technology to help the human beings here so i think we do it so it's it's a good question and um it's hard to answer but um i think what we do very well is we created a platform that detects vulnerabilities and uh and helps uh fixing them and so we we always have this mix um of uh detecting vulnerabilities uh auditing and then uh, finding the right way to fix it. And I think the first way um, it has, that has been done in cybersecurity is phishing simulation. So you detect the employees who are vulnerable to phishing simulation, and then you, you target uh, specific courses on those employees, basically. And I think we, we, we took this uh, method of detecting and fixing, and we uh, spread it to other uh, topics in cybersecurity. So I'll give you a simple example, but um, we deep, we deeply connect with uh, two-factor uh, with sorry with uh, Google Workspace, yeah. um, and we detect employees who don't have two-factor authentication activated, and so we know exactly how the percentage of your employees who don't have two-factor authentication activated, and we can target a course specifically on those employees, and um, we can guide them to uh, activate two-factor authentication. And we see a, a huge impact on companies um, and that, uh, I mean, two-factor authentication seems to be pretty basic, but still, I think 50% of all employees don't have two-factor authentication activated. 
And uh, it's something that you can do in five minutes that will improve tremendously your, uh, your security online. So it's really uh, important to do it. So we have this mix of detecting and fixing. And I, I mean, we do it for other topics, obviously. We do it for data breaches. Uh, we do it for a digital footprint, which is very important to me, I think. Uh, we do it for obviously for uh, for phishing, and we're trying to do it um, with uh, for uh, with uh, smishing as well, but it's much more difficult to do. Um, and on top of that, what we do is that we report it to uh, to the manager because we have access to the data. We can report the impact of the product on um, the security of the company to the manager. And I think this is a, a, a unique mix that we do. So the detecting, fixing, and reporting. Um, that has never been done before in cybersecurity awareness. And that's something that's very unique about Riot is uh, proving that we actually had an impact. Agreed. And we've had people on the show here, Benjamin, who have had products where they can educate end users or they can detect, uh, you know, simulate phishing and uh, detect vulnerabilities and things like that. What excited me about speaking to you today is that you're wrapping it all together. You're wrapping it all in one parcel for MSPs. And where you said about um, uh, end users, 50% of them not having multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication turned on, it is such a simple thing to do, but actually getting people to understand why it's powerful, that's the key. And I know lots of MSPs listening are going to be sort of pulling their hair out, saying, oh, just turn this on and it will eliminate or mitigate a lot of the, the threats that are out there. So really, really interesting to see that you've got a platform that does all of it. Can, can I ask, you mentioned Google Workspace there. Uh, can I ask about integration into other products? So lots of MSPs, for instance, use Microsoft Teams, Active Directory, that type of thing. What, what else does it integrate with Riot? Yeah, we, we started with Google Workspace, but uh, we now integrate deeply with Microsoft too. So basically the same set of features for both uh, platforms. Uh, so we send uh, the courses over Slack, but we also send it over Microsoft Teams. Yeah. Uh, and the experience is exactly the same. The content is exactly the same. Uh, we're, we're really, it's really the same set of features for both. Yeah. And I guess rewinding a bit, I'm intrigued in your personal experience. When you found out the CFO in your previous company had fallen prey to, you know, a simulated phishing attack. Of course, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, and and for anybody listening to this who, uh, you know, actually deploys a simulated phishing attack and finds out perhaps even that their own team within the MSP are vulnerable to this, how do you react? How do you approach that individual and educate them? Because presumably going, kicking the door open to their office and screaming at them for being an idiot is not the best way forward. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not the best way. But a side effect of running phishing simulation is, uh, um, it's a wake up call for a lot of employees too. Yeah. So you know, when they click and they understand, you know, we have like we have what we call the remedial page where they once they enter the password, we have a page saying, "Hey, uh, bad news, you got uh, you got fish, but uh, good news, it's an exercise." And then for a few weeks, because it's. Uh, I would I wouldn't say trauma, traumatic experience, but uh, it's it's a, a, a bit of a wake up call to employees that they are also um, they could they can be targets to hackers. Um, for a few weeks, they are much more careful um, than you uh, than usual uh, and to phishing attacks. So you have to repeat the exercises. Um, what we suggest is uh, to repeat it at least um, every quarter, but I would do it every six uh, weeks. Uh, yeah. for my team yeah and what's the um sophistication of the simulated phishing that you send because I, i'm guessing you know you and i are very familiar with the industry lots of uh, people listening to this show are cybersecurity experts they would probably say oh i'd be able to guess whether it's a simulation is that the case what what does it look like the emails that you send out so we we developed a catalog of phishing attacks um that we um, rated from easy to hard, uh, depending on the complexity. And uh, we have some of them who are very complex to spot, even for um, um, uh, technical people, I would say. Um, and we're also developing a, a, right now an aut autopilot mode uh, where we decide, I mean, an algorithm decides which attack to send uh, at a given moment. Um, so even as an admin of the program, you can activate the autopilot on yourself 
uh, and you will be, you would be attacked like any other employees. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm really intrigued actually to have a go in myself and see what it looks like. But perhaps when we get off air, I'll have a conversation with you about how we can use this within my own business there. But you mentioned uh, schmish. Let me put my teeth back in schmishing, which is fishing, SMS, yeah. uh, phishing yeah. sort of thing there. So that's something obviously you know for the for the future of the product, Riot. What about mobile device security? Is that something that you cover with Riot smartphones, tablets, that type of thing? It's a difficult problem um, because uh, most companies now don't have, uh, they, they're not providing, they don't provide a, a phone to employees. Uh, and so employees, they consider that their phone is their uh, personal life. Yeah. And that the company, even installing an app on the phone of, a, of an employee, if it's not a, pro, a, pro, a phone that has been provided by the company's heart. And so we're doing it the, the old way. So basically the bot, uh, interacts with, uh, sorry, the cybersecurity companion uh, interacts with the employee and uh, we have a, a, a course uh, where we ask the employee up front, hey, I have to ask how many, uh, how long is your passcode on your mobile phone? And from there, you know, we are that the content of the course. Most employees, they have a four digits long uh, passcode, which is to me a, a huge problem because, you know, your your phone has so much about you and uh, also because right now to fact authentication relies a lot on your phone so if i get access to your phone uh, even though you have two factor authentication it, it, it's not useful so it's not useful anymore because i get the text uh, with the the, the one-time code uh, but if i have your phone it's over so so basically we were in this course we um um the, uh, Albert is trying to guess your passcode uh, and the, it's a, a short game uh, where Albert asks uh, three questions and end up trying to guess your passcode. And, um, and basically it's based on a study on passcodes that says that 25% um, of the population have the same 10 passcodes. And usually it's very, I mean, humans are not very good at uh, creating um, unexpected uh, passcodes or passwords. Uh, so it's, they tend to use the same uh, 10 uh, passcodes everywhere. Yeah, yeah, really interesting there. And I wanna pick up on something you said, which is about like uh, Albert and the game. So gamification, I'm really intrigued about this. I think one of the keys to managed service providers' success with educating clients on cybersecurity is the gamification of cybersecurity protection. So I guess my question would be, how does Riot enable MSPs to track their clients' progress? So perhaps they've started off with 20% of vulnerabilities. Um, the client, the MSP wants to help the client get ideally to 0%. How do you track that progress and gamify it? So basically, when it's, our point, our most important KPI is the complete, what we call the completion rate. Yeah. Uh, the completion rate is uh, when I send a course to an employee, what's the chance, what are the chances that the employee completes the course? And um, we're currently at 86%, which seems good, but I would be happy after 90. Um, but um, that's something that we're tracking. And I mean, we're adapting the content of courses to, uh, to improve the completion rate and to make sure that the employee goes through the whole course uh, once we send it and uh, through the whole program. Um, what we have on our side is that uh, because we send it over Slack or Microsoft Teams, and there's much higher chances of the, the employee actually uh, taking the course because if I send it over email, it's just, I mean, you get, how many emails do you get every day, Richard? Oh, like hundreds, hundreds of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's probably, um, Something that that we're uh, lucky to use is uh, the channel of usually the channel of communication in the companies, uh, in companies. So um, that's also why we have such a good uh, completion rate right now. Yeah, because you said you integrate with Microsoft Teams, you integrate with Slack, yeah. those type of things. So you can use those as well to get the message across. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So we've referred to them a couple of times already, Albert. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I've seen Albert on your website. I've seen him in the product there. So where did the idea for Albert, the chatbot or the companion to come from? 
Uh, it's a long story, but basically, uh, initially when I created Riot, uh, setting up uh, phishing simulated attacks was a bit of a challenge because you had to go through a long tutorial to whitelist the, uh, our emails. Because, because it, so I said initially we were working with Google Workspace yeah. and uh, I mean, Google is not bad at spotting phishing. So um, very early we decided that we won't fight against uh, Google uh, spam filtering. Um, but at the time, what it meant is that um, you had to uh, do a, probably a 10 minutes setup on your Google Workspace to whitelist the IP addresses that we were using to send the phishing email. And it would be a very long process. Uh, and, you know, I'm a product person. So I thought if it's very difficult, maybe we can have in the onboarding, we can have a, um, a bot that would explain to the the CTO or to the, the IT manager um, what to do uh, in Google Workspace uh, to whitelist our emails. Um, and so we, I created this, uh, this bot uh, for the onboarding of the users on Riot. And I thought, hmm, that's actually a good format. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the experience doing the onboarding. Maybe that's something that Embrace would like to. And I mean, once you have that, you, it's pretty obvious that it should be on uh, sent over Slack because I mean, that's where all the communications happen. Um, so that's how uh, Albert initially, the, the initial idea of Albert came from. Yeah, and we'll include a link in the show notes to to everything we've talked about, you know, from Y Combinator to cybersecurity. But I'd encourage everybody listening, go and check Albert out on your website, because I think it's a really great example of how you can humanize, uh, you know, a, a bot, a companion to to actually help people get along. People people tend to like these things. And so it's a great way of uh, softening it. So um, we've looked at awareness training via Slack, via Microsoft Teams. Can you tell us more about how you would take, you know, MSPs to the next level with simulations? So after the basics, what can you do to perhaps help MSPs with that 5% of users who are, it's just not sinking in, you're just not getting there? So I think that's part of our job. I think we made a great uh, job at uh, making a, prog a product that's very easy to use and set up. Uh, so I, I, I told that uh, Google Workspace is very hard to, uh, to set up. You have to go through a long tutorial. It's not true anymore. Uh, now, right, it's like for, for MSP, it's probably a, a three minute stop setup. Um, I think we've done a lot of progress on that uh, and the really setting up and launching your first campaign. And uh, Richard, I hope you'll try it, but um, it's, it's probably you can send it in the, last five, in the next five minutes. Wow. So you usually, you, cre you create your account, it's Google sign-in. Uh, we sync automatically your employees from Google Workspace or from Microsoft, whatever. Um, both works exactly the same way. And uh, then you just have to, um, the whitelist doesn't happen anymore. Uh, we use the, the Gmail API. So it's really uh, three, three clicks and uh, you're good to go. And you can launch your first attack. And... Um, Obviously, you will, you, I mean, on the first attack, usually 20% of the employees end up clicking and entering the password. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's good that you know that. And um, then you repeat the attacks and you have new employees coming in. So you never get to 0%. And I think that's fine. That's it. You've done, you've done your, I mean, there's no silver bullet in cybersecurity. Yes. Uh, you need to double down on having two factor authentication everywhere. Uh, better passwords and so on so it's not there's no easy answer to that yeah you can only mitigate you can't eliminate I think regardless of education technology anything in between so yeah I, I'm interested as well so if an MSP has run a phishing drill they found their clients wanting a little bit what would you then suggest the MSP do to help the, you know, the clients uh, uh, be more safe going forward? Obviously, you've got the education, the awareness, but is there anything else the MSP can do as well? I mean, uh, in terms of uh, consulting, you mean? Yeah, so you know, educating end users, you've got the awareness training through Riot, but what can MSPs be doing to say to their clients, this is how you stay safe? I think I think MSP have a role on setting up the the platform the right way. Um, also, I I think it's so I, I didn't tell you that, but the first attack is completely free. The first campaign is completely free. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so anybody listening yeah. to this can try it out for free. 
Exactly, and they even can try it on their uh, customers as well. So the first attack can be launched. I mean, the first campaign can be launched up to uh, it can target up to a hundred employees. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, for most MSPs, uh, that that's good enough. And even for uh, we we put a limit somewhere, and a hundred employees is a good uh, uh, subset and gives you a good example of the vulnerability of a company. And I would I would encourage uh, MSPs to um, um, to to use the the first campaign uh, to convince uh, their uh, um, users that um, they need to invest more in, in their cybersecurity culture. Yeah. It's actually the the perfect way um, to um, to uh, show an example of something that can happen where you have um, a, a real KPI that you can use and track. Um, usually, I mean, you ask, you ask uh, a CEO, uh, is your team uh, safe? Usually they work, you know, the same way I was. Uh, they, they work with um, people that you selected, where you, you've been very selective at when you recruit. Uh, you think that um, they're clever people and uh, you think they won't click. And once you launch the attack, uh, you realize you need to invest more um, in terms of cybersecurity culture. Yeah, I'm I'm really interested to see that this could be used as a um, a foot in the door or even a sales tool for MSPs who speak to their clients. And, and we know that clients always think, oh, it's never going to happen to me. But if you can actually demonstrate to them in a safe environment, hey, you are not as safe as you think you are. You're perhaps overconfident when it comes to cybersecurity. This could be a really powerful way of actually starting that conversation with people. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good way. I mean, it's been working well for us. So yeah. it's really the right way to uh, to set up the to open the discussion. Yeah. So let's move forward a little bit. We've talked about awareness. We've talked about simulating phishing attacks. Talked about how Albert uh, can be the companion to help people educate them. What about data breaches, though? So if the unthinkable does happen, how does Riot help the MSP and their clients when a data breach occurs? No, so what we actually do is um, we we detect uh, data breaches that happen to your employees uh, based on your on their email addresses and based on uh, their phone number. So basically, because we sync directly with Microsoft and Google, uh, we use that data and track in real time when they when your employees appear in new data breaches. And what you see in uh, usually is when an employee appears in a new data breach, usually hacker and they're much more prone to attacks. So basically, let's say Richard, you're um, uh, you were part of the Facebook data breach. Um, I think that happened two years ago, yeah. uh, where your phone number leaked. It puts you uh, as a favorite target for uh, smishing attacks, right? Yes. Because yeah, now the hackers they have a easy way to uh, link your name, your email, your phone number, and uh, target you and make uh, sm and, and with the text. Uh, with your name and uh, with detailed information on you. And um, what we do is that we detect that in real time. Uh, and once we uh, know that you appear in, in a, a new data breach, we warn the employee. And uh, instead of just saying, hey, uh, you've been in, data, in the Facebook data breach uh, and your phone number leaked, we go one step forward and uh, we say, hey, uh, this is what it means for your safety, Richard. And this is what you have to prepare for. And uh, it's a bit of a... You know, like um, we, we go uh, one step uh, uh, beyond just telling you what's, uh, uh, what was part of the leak. Yes. Yeah. So you're educating and, people as well. Yeah. And something else that we do uh, that's a bit uh, controversial is uh, we, uh, if we can, we get the, the data and we show it to the user. Mm. So, for example, we are trying to, uh, to find the last known password that hackers have on you. And we would put it to your face and say, hey, Richard, you know this password that, uh, that you use everywhere because, you know, usually people, they use the same password everywhere. Yeah. We put it to your face and say, hey, stop using it because I, I mean, uh, obviously it's automatized. I mean, uh, the bot does the work for you. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's really different from just telling you, Richard, you've been in, in the data breach where your password uh, leaked and saying, hey, Richard, you know, uh, um, uh, cute, cute dog 83, you have to stop using that, uh, that password. 
Exactly. I know of an MSP based out of the US that does dark web monitoring and looks for these breaches. And when they when they're trying to speak to, say, CEO or the managing director of a, a potential client, and often, you know, you phone, you try to get through, you get stopped by the gatekeeper because CEOs are busy people. But they said they reached a point where they'll phone the uh, CEO, they'll, they'll reach reception or the office manager. Hey, can I speak to the CEO? Oh, he's not available or she's not available at the moment. Can I take a message? Yeah. Can you tell them I've got their password? So if they want to give me a call and we can discuss it. And of course, how quickly do you think they get a return call yeah. then? So yeah, you're right. It is controversial. But it, again, I think it's really demonstrating to people they are not as safe as they think they are. So yeah. In, in terms of the cybersecurity sphere, so obviously you, you mentioned you come from a finance uh, background with the last company. So since you founded Riot, uh, you know, have how immersed have you become in the cybersecurity industry as a whole? I mean, I was initially as a kid, I was, uh, I think I, I, I can... I'm, I'm, I was a hacker at some, at some point. When yeah. I was 12, I was hacking around. I mean, when, when I first got access to the internet, I ended up on a, on a French website called Cool Paradise uh, that was uh, gathering tutorials on how to uh, send Trojans to, um, to people. And so that, 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 that was before, I, I, it's not exactly true that I was in finance, I was in tech, but uh, yes. I'm a coder, you know, I've been coding for 20 years. Um, and uh, before I even coded, I was hacking around. So I was sending Trojans to people I didn't know. Uh, it, it didn't last long, probably a, a few <laughs> a few months, but um, I stopped very quickly and I, I had no financial interest at all. I was just interested in, uh, in the technological part of it, in uh, how internet works and how do I end up uh, opening the camera of, um, of someone in, uh, in Australia, you know? Yeah, so you you understand from the from the ground up what is capable what what a cyber criminals are capable of out there. Yeah, I, I, I have this background, but uh, to be honest, I didn't, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't pursue that so much. Uh, I, I was mostly interested in uh, on the on technical part. And uh, I ended up being a coder. I mean, I've been coding for most of my life. Uh, yeah. I haven't coded in, uh, probably in the last three years at all, but um, uh, yeah, initially I'm a, I'm a coder. I mean, the, the, the link between cybersecurity and finance is, is tech. I mean, um, yeah. and tech. And I started my career in fashion. So, you know, and it was tech at the time too. So, yeah, absolutely makes sense. And, and the majority of us in this industry get into it because we have a passion for technology. We have a passion for helping people. And, so, you know, in your case, you were very aware of uh, the potential pitfalls from it. So I can see why you've moved on uh, to founding Riot there. In terms of keeping abreast of what's happening in the cybersecurity industry, are there any experts or sources that you'd recommend our listeners follow to stay current on cybersecurity? There's a, a newsletter that I love um, called um, Zach, uh, This Week in Cyber in Security. I don't know if you, um, it's from a, a, a guy called uh, Zach Whitaker. Okay. Um, who's also, I think he's a journalist at TechCrunch. Yeah. Uh, and the, um, he, he sends a recap of what happened during the week. I think he sends it on, on Monday, so um, in, on Sunday. Uh, I see that now. Um, I, I love the way it, it, uh, it, it, so usually it's like 15 articles, but it gives us a quick summary of all of them. Um, so you have, it's pretty easy to, to read and you get an overview of what happened last week. That's interesting. And we'll include, if you can share a link with me for that one, um, I'll include that in the show notes afterwards so that our so. listeners can take a look. I'm not familiar with it, but that sounds really interesting as well. So um, on the subject of cybersecurity, can I ask you a, cu a couple of new terms I've heard recently? We've meant to mentioned smishing, which I can't say properly, but in cybersecurity terms, what is tailgating? Tailgating is uh, when someone follows you when you go through the door. Mm. Or try to, uh, yeah. And uh, during COVID, it was not uh, very useful to, um, but we have a course on tailgating, but um, it's interesting because it's, phys it's physical security, you know, uh, how people can um, exploit um, um, other people to get into the door and, uh, and go to your office. Got it. So it's it's the physical terms and it's where people hold door. And, and in Britain, we're very bad for this. We'll hold the door open for somebody 
uh, behind, which is, uh, you know, uh, considered good manners. But of course, if you're letting somebody into a secure building, not so wise. I don't have a good advice for you, but uh, in the course, uh, so we have a course on tailgating. We're just teaching people how to say politely, uh, who are you? Yeah, rather than just close the door in their face. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so so another, another one that I've come across, and I think I know what this is, perhaps you can clarify, but what is CEO fraud? So CEO fraud is, um, and that's actually a very interesting topic because it's directly re related to a digital footprint. Uh, CEO fraud is um, a much more sophisticated phishing attack where I would I would use the name of your uh, the CEO of the company and target um, and employees with that. Got it. So it's, and we do. Um, sorry, go ahead. Also, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, we we also simulate phishing attacks coming from the CEO. So uh, a very common example is the what I call the gift card attack. So basically, uh, uh, the assistant would receive an email from the CEO uh, supposedly um, and uh, asking for a, a, a quick service to uh, go buy a, a gift card for a very important customer. Yeah, and, and of course, it's not from the CEO, but because somebody gets the email with the boss's name on, they feel as though they've got to go ahead and do that. So, okay. And it, it is, it's been evolving in the last few uh, months and uh, now it's happening much more often on, uh, on WhatsApp. And that, that's very interesting because, I mean, you can easily buy a, a phone number. Uh, you can easily uh, register on, on WhatsApp. You can easily put the, the profile picture you want. Uh, I can put your, your face, Richard, and, um, and yeah. send a, a message to someone you know saying, hey, it's Richard, can you, uh, I, need, I need a service, can you help me with that? And, um, it's much harder to um, to spot um, because yeah. there are so many, um, you know, I would say uh, green flags that uh, that it's uh, legitimate. Exactly, I've seen that happen on Facebook, Facebook Messenger, where people open a fraudulent Facebook accounts and they've included your profile picture and photos of you. They add friends. Then they drop a, a Facebook message to somebody saying, hey, can you can you help me out here and transfer some money here or, or whatever? So I guess CEO fraud is that at the corporate level, isn't it? Uh, targeting uh, targeting employees. Yeah. And it's also directly related to uh, what we talked about earlier, about data breaches, you know. Uh, getting your phone number is much easier than, than it was before. And uh, so that's also why uh, we see a growing uh, number of attacks over WhatsApp, over um sms as we said as we discussed yeah and uh, also probably the next step is uh, uh over a phone call right yeah uh, have you come across the um artificial intelligence the the voice simulation where people are now simulating voices yeah deep deep fakes yeah it's uh, a, a new course that we're releasing this month really okay uh, yeah uh I don't know. Have you have you read this uh, this uh, crazy story about this uh, mother in uh, Arizona who gets um, a phone call from her daughter? Have you heard this story? No, tell me. This one is crazy. So basically, um, she gets a, a phone call supposedly from her daughter, uh, and she the daughter says, uh, "I messed up. Uh, I screwed up badly." And um, a, a guy takes uh, 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 takes the phone and says. Uh, we got your daughter. Uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna kill her if you don't pay a million dollars to this account, account. Yeah. And basically, they just so basically they ripped up the um, the voice of the daughter from TikTok and made a fake um, message um, to 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 imitate the voice of the daughter. And they called them the mother and asked for a ransom. Wow, that is absolutely terrifying, isn't it? And I think we're gonna. You know that I, I can see how MSPs are going to be affected by this because if you get a phone call instead of like it's like CEO fraud, but if you get a phone call from somebody that you think is your client asking you to do something, that's scary, isn't it? It is, and especially to CFOs. Uh, imagine imagine the, the the CFO of my uh, previous company and uh, gets a phone call from the CEO asking for a, a bank transfer. Uh, I would be um, interested in knowing if she actually do it yeah yeah we, we need to put more frameworks in place don't we for checking and double checking so you've got to um that old phrase of trust but verify 
you know, we've got to do these things going forward because the world is getting way too scary and sophisticated, you know, to just trust on its own. Exactly. That's, that's, that's where our right comes in. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you as well, we, we've talked a little bit about the products, but what does the support for the Riot products look like? So if MSPs have got challenges, uh, you know, how, how can they can they reach out to people? What, what sort of hours do you do for support? What sort of methods? Yeah, so support has been very important. I mean, customer, customer success has been very important to me uh, since the early days. And in the early days, I was adding every customer uh, on, on Slack. So they would reach out day and night. Um, and we've been trying to scale that even now that we are covering. Um, today, we're covering 100,000 employees, I think. Wow. Um, and I think uh, we're trying to keep the same uh, level of support uh, as we scale. Um, and uh, so we, we set up uh, Intercom on the bottom right corner uh, of the platform so people can very easily, and that applies to MSP too, they yes. can very easily um, reach out um, and we, we try to, I think we have a, a below 10 minutes uh, reply um, uh, uh, usually. Excellent, yeah. And, and we talked about how you've got employees in different countries. Are there, uh, do you currently offer multilingual or is that a plan for the future? Yeah, we support four different languages right now. So um, initially French and English, obviously. Uh, and we added recently uh, Spanish and German. Excellent. And the next uh, two we're adding is Italian and uh, Portuguese. Wonderful. So because we get an audience from all over the world here. So even though we're an English language speaking podcast, I know that uh, we've got a lot of friends in Spain, Germany, other places who are going to be interested in deploying this uh, to their native language speaking clients. I, I also think there's going to be a lot of MSPs listening to this who need, you know, need some help, need some assistance with their clients uh, who want, want to meet certain regulations, you know, so GDPR, PCI, HIPAA in America, those are just three. Can Riot help in the journey towards regulation for clients as well? Uh, yeah. Um, so we started doing that. Uh, it's been an internal debate uh, whether we should uh, go beyond uh, just cybersecurity and, uh, yeah. you know, even cover uh, all compliance needs. Uh, for example, the... Um, you know, should we provide a sexual harassment uh, program or something like this? Um, for now, we're, we started by doing GDPR because we had, uh, we personally had, as, as you would imagine, a, a French uh, a team in France. Um, we need to, um, to um, teach uh, GDPR to our, t to our team. Uh, so we started a, a GDPR program that's uh, currently in, in the work. We have one course on personal data that's already online, um, and we're we're working on four more uh, that would be available on the platform. Yeah, I can see the scope for this platform growing way beyond where you are at the moment as well, and uh, so that's going to be going to be very interesting in future. Um, in terms of the partnership program for MSPs, what what does that look like? How can MSPs join up? Um, it's a good question. Uh, they have to reach out to Audrey, who is the, our head of partnership at yeah. Audrey at tryriot.com. Uh, we also have a dedicated page on the website where, can, where they can uh, sign in. And I mean, something that's great about Riot is that it's, uh, they can sell phone board too. Uh, yeah. So you don't have to, uh, you can just try the product in the, in, in, in the next five minutes. Um, and obviously, MSPs they get very discounted uh, price uh, pricing, and uh, they get the the premium support that we provide to everyone. Excellent. And in terms of the product itself, how is Riot licensed? Is it like per site, per user? What does that look like? Yeah, it's uh, price per employee covered. Um, yeah. Knowing that the first uh, uh, campaign, as we as we discussed earlier, is always free up to hundred employees. Wow, that's very cool. And again, we'll in, for, for those listening, we will include all of this in the show notes so people can check it out afterwards. As we come near the end of our time together, Benjamin, I'm just going to ask on a personal level, who's inspired or mentored you? Is there anybody who you consider a big influence in your career? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work on that question. That's so okay. We're going to have to... Um, or, 
Are you okay for time, by the way? I know we've only got a couple of minutes. So do you need to yeah, run? Yeah, of, of course. Yeah, yeah no worries. Cool. Um, can, can you ask it again? And uh, I'll yeah. try to find the clever I, I do that answer. with that. Yeah, no worries. So on a personal level, uh, Benjamin, I'm, I'm intrigued. Who has inspired have you, uh, you? Have you got any mentors? Who's made you a better entrepreneur? Who's an influence in your career? Uh, I think one of them is Magellan, the, the explorer, you know, who uh, yeah. discovered uh, a way south of uh, South America to go through the um, um, India. Yeah. Um, so why is he such an inspiration to you? So, you know the story of Magellan? Yes. I you do. know, they, initially he thought that he could go... Um, uh, to India by um, because he thought that he read somewhere that um, uh, there was a, a, a way through uh, Buenos Aires where you can uh, get to uh, to the to India. Uh, the, there was a path uh, there, and obviously he brought uh, four different boats and uh, brought a ton of people with him um, and discovered that uh, you know um, um, obviously you don't go th uh, to India through Buenos Aires. Uh, and um, they discovered that probably very early in the in the journey, you know. Um, and um, so he had those four boats full of people, probably hundreds of people. Of people. And um, you know, he had to guide them and uh, lead and to be a, a great leader to uh, bring them to uh, India. And um, I mean, that's a they had a long journey, and uh, he had to uh, to take the good decisions to make uh, make it there. Mm. So that it's still to me, it's Magellan is one of the greatest leader of of, uh, of all time. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. What about books and things? Do you, are you an avid reader? Do you find yourself recommending or giving books to other people often? I don't. I don't read that much, uh, to be honest. Um, I read a lot of articles, obviously, um, mm. and especially uh, cybersecurity articles. One book that I read uh, repeatedly is How to uh, uh, Make Friends and uh, Win Influence. Influence. Have you, have you read yeah. that one? Is that that's, uh, Dale Carnegie? Dale Carnegie, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's, I, I found it very useful. Yeah. I'm, I'm, again, for people listening, we'll include all of this in the show notes here. But it's interesting. I asked that question, Benjamin, to a lot of the guests on the show. And Dale Carnegie's work comes up quite often. So it's really interesting that uh, so many entrepreneurs tend to get influenced uh, by that. So Have you read it? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's uh, something that... I think I got a, not an original edition, but when was it published? It was published in the 1950s, I think, was it? Something like that. So. Yeah, yeah. I think even earlier, I think. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's it. But, but it's still I, very but, accurate, you know? Yeah. And the, and the language has changed a little bit, but the, the underlying lessons, the underlying uh, education there is still sound today, isn't it? Yeah, people don't change. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm very conscious of our time, uh, Benjamin. Thank you for, for giving up your time to speak to us today. Before we go, I've got to ask, what's next for Riot? What can we expect in the future for the company? Much more AI. Uh, AI is a big topic for us, and uh, it's just not a trend. So it's yeah. not a trend. I mean, we've been investing a lot on AI uh, in the past few years. Um, and um, the cybersecurity companion that we have, uh, I think will take a much more important part uh, in cybersecurity teams in the future. And um, the capabilities of the, the cybersecurity companion will um, um, be um, much, much better um, in the coming months. Yeah, well, we'll keep an eye on that. So for anybody listening to this who wants to find out more about Riot, who wants to meet Albert in person, so to speak, <laughs> Uh, or indeed anybody who wants to reach out to you, Ben, and uh, continue the conversation, what's the best way for them to reach you? I'm, I'm Ben at tryriot.com and I'm pretty much everywhere. Benjamin Netter on Twitter, Benjamin Netter on LinkedIn, everywhere. Yeah. And if anybody wants to um, get involved with Riot, have a look at it, take advantage of the, you know, the, the free simulated attack that you offer, uh, what's the, the best way for them to go about that? The website, uh, you can always send, always send from board. So you just enter your email and you, you'd re you would receive an, e um, an email right away um, inviting you to the platform. Got it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, Benjamin, this has been a fascinating interview. I wish you all the best with the product. And, and perhaps you can come back and speak to us again in the near future and tell us how the product has developed. Hopefully, yes. And thank you so much for having me, Richard. My pleasure. Thank you, Ben. 
Bye-bye.